Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Jeff Diefenbach, and I'm the staff director for a group at MIT called the Integrated Learning Initiative. I'm going to get out of the way as quickly as I can because we've got some researchers here that you're going to hear from. But welcome. Uh, feel free to come in a bit. Most of them don't bite. Um, and, and the rest, it's gentle. So uh, let, me, let me quickly run down the topic areas that we've got. And we're, we're approaching this across the demographics of pre-K to 12 learners, higher ed learners, and workforce learners. Uh, and so from my uh, left moving across, we've got Meredith Thompson, Inma Borella, and I'm hoping I'm getting closer on the pronunciation, and uh, George Westerman. I'll talk briefly about MIT Open Learning, which I hope you've noticed is one of the co-hosts of the conference. There are three broad pillars within open learning. The first is the group that I head, the Integrated Learning Initiative. You can think of us as learning science. We're the group that helps faculty who study learning effectiveness get their work done. The next group, the Jameel World Education Lab, is a membership-based organization that I think of as learning engineering. They're applying the findings of learning science in prototype and pilot and small-scale settings uh, at the direction and the guidance of their members. And finally, there's the Office of Digital Learning, which is where learning at scale happens. These are uh, starting with OpenCourseWare, which I think is now 17 or 18 years old, uh, but other MOOC and online platforms, MITx, MicroMasters, and XPro, uh, experiential programs that are both uh, online and in person, like boot camps. Um, all of those programs come together to reach learners at scale. And again, these happen with different demographics, sometimes more than one of them, but birth up through the end of uh, grade 12, higher education, and, uh, and workplace and lifelong learning. So I'll use one final slide to frame how we think about the science of learning. We look at the learner, we look at instruction, and we look at policy. And these are intentionally overlapping because often the questions overlap. But for instance, thinking about a learner and their prior knowledge or their motivation or their interest or their physiological readiness and how those differences affect learning. Thinking about instruction and the content and the delivery and the assessment and how that happens and how those differences affect learning. And at the policy level, law, access, funding, leadership, broad-based measurement, those all will have an impact on learning. And we really need a perfect storm of all of those things to come together in a relatively optimized way for learning to happen. So with that, I'm going to turn the uh, session over to Meredith, and she's going to talk you through some really exciting stuff. All right. I'm going to do this right. OK. Welcome, everybody. We are in the nap time here after lunch and right before the rest of it. So feel free to, you know, to wiggle any time uh, that, that you feel like it. Um, I'm really glad. Thank you for inviting me here today, Jeff. Um, and one of the things we're going to talk about is different ways of learning. Um, I work on a project called the Collaborative Learning Environments in VR, or the Clever Project. And um, what, you, what you see here are two of our uh, designers, two of the people who actually design and program the virtual reality experience that we are developing. I want you to take a minute. Don't close your eyes, because I'm afraid you'll take a nap. But I want you to think about what you think of if you had to draw a cell, like a biology cell, what you would draw. You would probably draw a circle. Maybe you draw the nucleus, everybody remembers the nucleus, and the mitochondria, everybody remembers the mitochondria. Well, in fact, the cell is a complex and dynamic place, and one of the things we want to do with technology is to do things we can't otherwise do. So what if you could learn about a cell by actually being inside of it? And that's what we're doing in the Collaborative Learning Environments and Virtual Reality Project. Um, we're looking at creating an educational game. Uh, about cellular biology, but not just about conceptual understanding, but also about the development of skills. Because more and more, we are learning that we need to develop these skills, skills like networking, like collaborative problem solving, in order to succeed in the workforce of tomorrow, and even in the workforce of today. Everybody's going to ask you, you will all ask me after this presentation, and I welcome you, why VR? Because, you know, here we are. We're in reality, and it's pretty immersive, right? It's pretty, it's pretty impactful. Well, there are lots of reasons. And one of the reasons is that you can, we, the things that you learn most significantly in your life, when you learn how to walk, when you learn how to talk, you learn how to interact with other people, you learn with your entire body, not just with your eyes and your ears and maybe writing something down. What VR allows you to do, it is allows you to learn with your entire body. We can do the impossible. We can go inside a cell. We can use game-based learning and project-based learning in meaningful ways. And you can also so do things like connect with other people, engage in flow, have experiential learning. And also, it's cool and it's new. When I talk to teachers, when I talk to students about VR, they are like, 
cool, this is new. And the teachers are like, so it's novel. If it engages students, we want it. We want to figure that out. We are trying to go beyond the novelty effect and really think about how to make this a meaningful learning experience. So imagine you are inside a cell. And a cell, rather than the Whitman sampler that you probably pictured in your head and you saw in the textbooks, where everything is neatly laid out and two-dimensional and neatly labeled, the cell is a complex and dynamic place with lots of stuff going on. And imagine you are inside of the cell. And not only that, but you are working with somebody who has a tablet. You are the explorer. The person with the tablet is the navigator. You have different information, and you have to figure out what's wrong with this cell. We've done this with teachers, upper right-hand corner, with students in a workforce development program up in Gloucester called Gloucester Biotech Academy. Talk to me about that, too. I'm very passionate about workforce development and alternative pathways to the workforce. We've done this with um, high school students. I actually just got 80, through, 80 students through a VR uh, experience um, in DC a couple of weeks ago. People are excited about this. A lot of times, it's the first time they've ever been in VR. So it's really important to have rules to establish clear rules about what you do and what you say when you're in VR. It's also important to have roles, and we've built the roles right in. We have the explorer and we have the navigator. And finally, it's important to balance those resources. You have to create something called positive interdependence. We need to work together in order to solve this problem. We can't just have one person figure it out on their own. And that's what we do with collaborative problem solving. You are working on teams where you have parts of information, you have a way of looking at a problem that other people don't have. And that's something we need to work on. So how do we use technology to do stuff we, ha we can't otherwise do to make collab learning the 21st century skills an impactful and context-based rather than just, oh yeah, we all know how to work together. We know how to do that. We're doing that through the collaborative learning environments in um, virtual reality. We have done some research on this. And when people are at the end of this, first of all, they understand biology a little bit better. That's my next slide. And second of all, every Everybody says, gee, we could have really collaborated better. We could have communicated better. And the cool thing about a game is you can play it again. Let's work on those skills. Let's learn a little bit more about biology, because the more you see something, the more connections you make. And we found that both of those things happen. And here's what happens. We have people draw a cell beforehand. Remember how I asked you to envision a cell? And we have them draw after. And what we find is that they're more aware of the cell structure and shape. They draw more organelles and types of organelles. They understand where their location are. And they also understand function um, more than they did at the beginning. So I have a lot of people to thank on this, but um, I'll let you read their names. I'm happy to talk more about this afterwards. Ask me the challenging questions. I like those the best. And I'm going to hand this um, back to Jeff. Thanks, Meredith. That was great. Uh, I hope that we all go at that same speed, because that's the speed of research at MIT. Um, <laughs> we're going to see or, or hear about four projects, but uh, across the institute there are hundreds of faculty members who study learning. This is in addition to, or this is their main area of focus, but physicists study learning, uh, metallurgists study learning, economists study learning. Um, I may have misled you a bit in that you're gonna hear only from researchers. I'm gonna cover some work done by Professor Esther Duflo and her team on math games. This is some work done with school systems in India and they pick math games because they're finding that they've got first time learners coming into the schools very much not prepared for schools. This, they don't have the same kind of preschool network that at least some children in the US can access. So depending on, on which region you're in, you've got somewhere between 60 and 90% of students aged to three to five are already enrolled in preschool. Uh, the rest aren't, of course. Um, there's now a move to establish these as more of a government-based school, but there's no national guidelines. And there are a lot of concerns about the curriculum. So the question that this project is asking, can we leverage the findings from cognitive development literature to make games that lead to better outcomes in math? The way the games are working here, there's an I do, you, uh, we do, you do model. So first, the teacher models how this is going to work using a large card version of what the children are going to be playing with when they work together. We do, a teacher and several students use those cards to now show how the game is going to work interactively. Uh, as with Meredith's project, there's a collaboration effort that's going on here. And finally, you do, where the children get together in groups and play it themselves. The way the study set up, 141 schools run by their Department of Education. Uh, 
141 kindergarten classes and 141 first grade classes. So those are paired at each of the schools. And because this is a randomized control trial, the idea is to have both a group who are working with the game environment and a group of learners who aren't. Um, so their time isn't wasted. They're doing math things, but they're just not doing it with a game-based environment. Uh, here's an example of one of the games, number comparison. Uh, depending on the age of the student, they're going to use these cards at the bottom. You're seeing the front and the back. So the front of the card has the numbers 13 and 11 on it. The back has a visual representation of that. And the children are supporting, uh, sorting those cards into bins, red or blue as you can see on the table, based on which number's larger. So in this case, the card would go into the red bin. With the kindergarten group, the numbers are lower. They're 1 to 20. And the number of, uh, of cards that have the, uh, the um, double-sided nature drops, so the dots go away on, um, on most of these cards. With the first graders, the numbers get higher, and eventually all of the dots go away, so they're working purely symbolically, not just with representations of, uh, of items. A second example, finding shapes and properties. So here, the student is shown the, the blue or the red um, uh, uh, target, and they're asked to, to say which shape it's like. So this is purely a visual representation. And then there's a symbolic representation where they have to say which of the two shapes matches the characteristic of the symbol being shown. So of course, it's going to be the triangle again because of its three sides. So the, the theme that's being woven throughout this is going from a non-symbolic to a symbolic representation of numbers with these kindergarten and first grade children. Uh, next up, I'm going to hand things over to uh, Dr. Inma Barella, who's going to talk to us about zombies. Thank you. How does this work? Uh, forward. All right. Let's see. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today, and thanks, Jeff, for, for this opportunity to speak about our project. I hope you're all interested in online learning. Great. How many of you have ever taken a massive online course? Great. That's fantastic, awesome. So that's what we do. Uh, I'm being part, I do research in supply chain management, but I'm fascinated by uh, learning. I've been part of the um, MITx MicroMasters in Supply Chain Management team since um, I started one year and a half ago. And this is a really interesting program. It's a program that is based in five massive online courses and a comprehensive final exam that is also online and proctored. So anyone who completes this, well, completes this program is eligible to apply for a master's blended program at MIT and get an MIT master's degree in only five months at a fraction of the price. Um, I think it's worth noticing that we have two kinds of learners in our courses. We have audit learners and verified learners. Audit learners just access the courses, most of the content for free, and they can learn for free. And then we have verified learners who pay a fee, $200 per course, and if they pass the course, that means they achieve 60% of more or more uh, of grade, they um, will get a certificate. And they're in the path of achieving the credential for the MicroMasters. So since 2014, we run 29 massive online courses and three comprehensive final exams. The next one coming at the end of February. And more than a quarter million learners have enrolled our courses. But despite the success of our program, there's something that still bothers us, and that's the dropout rate. Um, and we focus on the dropout rate on verified learners, because verified learners have paid a fee. They showed a, an interest and an intention of completing the course and getting a certificate, right? Because they paid. Uh, and still, if we look at the data from 2017, when we ran nine courses and had around 12,000 enrolled verified learners, we see that one third of them, and sorry for the colors, they, they were right before coming here, um, but one third of them never completed the course they enrolled as verified. And this is worrying. So um, we decided to look at uh, two factors that we think they're pretty uh, characteristic of a learner. If you want to learn in an online course, you should watch videos and do the homework. So uh, we classified our verified learners uh, according to these two factors. And we found out that a big chunk of them behave as we expected. 
as learners. They watch videos, they do the homework, great. But we also have voyeurs. They watch videos, but they never complete any homework. And we have zombies who do not watch videos and do not submit homework. And we even have magicians mm -hmm. who surprisingly do not watch any videos and are able to submit the homework. Thankfully, these are almost a 0% because um, if they were, it was a bigger number that, that would be worrying. And even among our learners, we, uh, not all of them complete the course. So from this 80%, 20% are actually learners that at some point drop out, so abandon the course, and 65% complete. What we want in an ideal world would be to move voyeurs and zombies into the learner's bucket and then reduce the dropout rate to have most of our learners completing the courses. And uh, this is the motivation for our uh, current research project um, that is guided by two questions. Can we predict which learners, verified learners, will drop out by analyzing their behavior on the edX platform? Because we, want, we can gather data from the edX platform on a weekly basis. And also, what interventions are effective to reduce the dropout rate? So we are working on building a predictive model to um, identify which learners are likely to drop out, identify the most relevant predictors, and propose and rigorously test targeted interventions to reduce the dropout rate, to see what works and what doesn't work. Some initial findings, um, we started working on the predictive model. We extracted the data, uh, historical data from our courses, and applied different machine learning algorithms. And uh, we found out that Random Forest is the algorithm that works the best with our data. And right now, we're able to identify four out of five dropouts. But of course, this, I mean, this is great, but we need to know what is useful, what works, to reduce the dropout rate. We know who is going to drop out. How can we change that? How can we re-engage them into the course? So we are working on designing interventions. To design them, we're taking into account the most relevant predictors we identified from the models, from the predictive models. We're also uh, taking into account uh, the most uh, important dropout factors identified in the academic literature and feedback we are gathering from our students. Um, we already have like, some interventions designed and we're implementing them in the courses we're currently running. So more insights to come. Um, thank you so much. And, yeah. I can answer questions uh, later if, if you're interested. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, great. So I'm George Westerman. I uh, run workplace learning at the Jamil World Education Lab. And um, Jeff had talked about what we're doing there. What we're trying to do is we're trying to take all the learning we've done for pre-K to 12 and for um, higher ed and make this available and make more systematic the whole process of workplace workforce learning. So we're research driven, driven insights that help us you know, be ready for the modern economy. You can see some of the topics we're doing research on. Designing the learning organization, what are trends or future skills, uh, career advising, future ready competencies, these kinds of things. So uh, I wanna share one piece of research that we did, uh-oh, Oh, there it is. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, one piece of research we did looking at the people who are trying to make workforce learning happen in organizations. We talked to um, the senior most executive for training in 19 different organizations to try to understand what are the patterns we're seeing and how companies are training their people. We saw there are two kinds of people. They're trainers. These are basically order takers. What do you need done? What compliance learning do we need to do? Okay, let's hear the courses, take the courses, and you know, we're done. On the other hand, we're seeing a new kind of model emerge here, and that is the transformer. And the transformer is taking a much more proactive version of this effort. They're not just training, they're seeing their role differently. They're a real strategic partner in making the culture change, making the organization change. Uh, and as a result, you know, they're facilitating, they're not just putting a lot of content out there. Um, and what's happening is rather than being an order taker with a budget line item that's always under pressure, these people are actually because they're being seen as helping the transform, it really is being seen as an investment that they, they can then justify and continue to go for. Uh, so you see, out of the 19, two organizations were, were 
trainers, four organizations were transformers. The other are, are in this transition mode. Uh, they're just getting, they're starting to get some of these practices and not all of them. So when we looked through and said, what's the difference between a trainer and a transformer? We saw three different transformations need to take place. Number one, we need to transform the learning goals. And I've already talked about that a little bit. Then we need to transform the learning methods. And then we need to tra actually transform the learning unit itself. And I'll go through these very quickly to give you an idea. We have a report that we're putting together. It will be ready in about a week. And so you can email me to get the, to get the report uh, if you want to learn more about this. The way I think about this is that you know many of you are um, either trying to make learning happen in your institution or some of you in, or, or in organizations, in corp companies, many of you also are trying to sell to these. And maybe this can help you figure out what to sell and how. Uh, so transforming learning goals, it really is from safeguarding compliance kinds of issues uh, and doing the basics to really enabling the organizational change. So how can we help the business units meet their goals, not how can we just make sure the training happens? And uh, it's about the culture, growth mindset, digital competencies, these kinds of things. It is amazing to me how many people in charge of learning and development put courses up there and account number of hours of the courses, and that's it. Um, it, it, it has to move beyond there. No wonder their budgets are under pressure, right? Uh, transforming the learning experience, we don't need to talk about this because that's why we're here. Uh, transforming the learning unit, we're seeing some very interesting things going on. One is the organizations are becoming smaller and they're becoming very value focused. So where a lot of learning execs are saying, I don't know, I can't justify my cost, but they keep asking me, these companies really are starting to get out to the value side of things. They're becoming faster, more ag agile. They're also caring more about the experience. So you see these new roles, the experienced designer, the content strategist. You see some communications and more promotion stuff going on there. And the focus. The focus is less on getting very specific technical schools, so still doing that, but what are the skills we need that are gonna change the business, not just these technical things? Because people can get these technical skills elsewhere. And they're trying to get adaptability, other things they're teaching. Other things they're getting, they're, instead of creating it, they're doing a lot more curation. They're also doing a lot more co-creation. So finding the expert out in the business that knows this stuff and working with them to, to develop their own content that we can make happen, bringing it together. A very different model from what we're seeing in a lot of organizations. Uh, so the conclusion of this is, you know, I, I just took a 5,000 word, four or five month study and turned it into four minutes. So there's a lot more to say here with lots of examples of how companies are doing this. But the conclusion is there's a choice to make. You can be a trainer. Your budget can be under threat. You can continue to be disrespected in the organization. And you'll stay that way as long as they want to keep you around. Uh, you can be a transformer and really help your organization get to where it is. This is where the respect comes in. We're seeing this happening more and more in organizations. We've got plenty of examples in the report. And um, just want to be shared. One of the things we're going to be doing is trying to help other people get these techniques in their organizations. Uh, if I can just say one more thing, many of you are trying to sell to corporations. Here are some open challenges we saw there that are just wonderful opportunities if somebody in ed tech wants to try to solve them. So things like measuring performance, we can measure it for technical skills. It's much harder to measure it for the more, the less technical jobs that are out there. Uh, you know, on a computer, if you're on a call center, you absolutely know how to do that. If you are um, in measuring somebody like a manager, much tougher. Making compliance training more engaging. I think Meredith's got a great idea. We got some great idea on the zombies. There's more to be done there, right? Integration. These LMSs are a mess. You know this. Uh, everybody knows this. How can we make that integration happen a little better? The competency assessment, especially for these future ready, the, the workplace skills as opposed to the technical. Or training us. How do we train critical thinking? How do we train empathy? These kinds of things. And then two others, the three others that are just emerging much more and more, how can we understand the talent profile of the company? Uh, is there a way we can assess this other than asking people, what are your skills, right? And how do we link that to gaps? More and more competency maps, career maps that can help to guide people through and more and more to the extent, how can we help with real career advising for people that are in companies and people that are outside companies looking to get that next role? So if you're in ed tech and you're looking to sell to corporations or, or workplace learning, here are some wonderful opportunities to go after. Thank you. One of my favorite quotes is Mark 
Twain saying that if I had more time, I would have written you a shorter letter. And I think these four researchers have done a phenomenal job, well, three and me uh, echoing the words of, of another researcher, of taking thousands of, wor uh, of words, thousands of hours, and distilling it down into something quick. Within open learning, there are probably at any given time many tens of research projects going on, and within the Institute more broadly, many more than that. So I'd certainly like to thank them for their time and their work, but also their time coming here. Um, we've got some time, uh, about 15 minutes, for question and answer, and maybe to put a little bit of structure around that, asking any one of them about their work or where they might take their work, or more generally about the kinds of learning research that you'd like to see MIT tackle, we'd love to hear it. And there are microphones, uh, and we see we've got uh, somebody ready to go. So. Sure, Ralph Sheridan, Value Management. Uh, George, I had flashbacks listening to your dulcet tones, uh, because I took your course in uh, October, November on Internet of Things. Oh, cool. Uh, which is on, it's, uh, the, uh, it's on the Get Smarter platform out of, uh, I guess, London, South Africa. Uh, but it, it's interesting because it's all adult learners. They're all professionals. Everyone, almost everyone's employed. And I think there were 90 kids and 90 adults in the program uh, scattered around the world, Latin America, a, uh, Dubai, Singapore, Korea, and, and Europe. Uh, so here's, here's my question. Uh, and it also ties to some of the comments uh, from Enma's Ema's, yes. uh, presentation. Uh, there's a big difference between uh, students uh, and teaching students and teaching adults. Uh, you know, one of the reasons you have such great dropout is that you're, where you're focused is on students that are taking a lot of basic level entry-level courses. And when you get to adults who are paying, in the case of the Get Smarter courses, they're anywhere from $2,000 to $3,000 a piece, unless you're on a corporate package, uh, there's a lot of skin in the game. Um, but it's all about engagement. And the Get Smarter platform is very good, but it needs to get better. Mm -hmm. And so given all that, where are you taking this platform and how are you going to take the lessons from what you're doing at Sloan down into MITx? And it was that for you? Both of you. Both of us. Uh, yeah, that, that, you know, it's interesting. The platform that we're on is a very engaging process. We have very few dropouts. One is because people pay for it. Two is because they get a certificate at the end. But three is there are, you know, none of us talks for more than five minutes at a time. There are discussion sections. There's homework every week. All these things to make sure that you do stay. And there are people that send you emails if you haven't done anything to say, hey, are you awake, right? Are you still with us? All those things help with the engagement. And the interesting thing, I'd love to talk to you offline, is what else can, you know, what didn't feel engaging? Because we definitely want to do more there. Uh, it's, as you can tell, it's also a very labor-intensive process to do that, which is why the costs are so high, partly. Um, and so we also want to figure out how to make that less labor-intensive to get the same outcomes. One of the things I know needs to happen is to make the social part more po possible. We see in a lot of these courses that uh, people do these meetups locally just to be able to talk a little bit with each other. Why can't we do those meetups virtually and get that same kind of self experience? I know the technology is not there yet, but could we make more of those things happen? Okay. Yeah, that's, that's, thanks for the question. I, I agree with you that what we need to do is increase engagement so people don't drop out. Our program is definitely different to George's because our is massive, right? We have thousands of students from all around the world, from a range of ages that goes from 15 to 90, and uh, um, they, they pay $200. That's not like paying thousands of dollars. So um, it's, if they drop out, it's, you know, they're not losing that much money at the end. Uh, so we're looking into ways of increasing engagement. We were thinking about uh, maybe more social interaction might help. But I'm not sure because our courses are highly technical. And I think a lot of people just struggle with the technical part. They're not expecting it. And that's why they drop. That's one hypothesis. Another is they don't get enough um, social interaction. And we're trying to deal with that by offering these meetups, uh, facilitating the meetups in different parts of the world for MicroMasters learners so they can, support, can have supported study groups. And improving also the interaction in forums. 
but yes, yeah, still a long, long way to go. And if you have any suggestions, since many of you have taken massive online courses, I will be very happy to, to have them. Yeah. I'll get to this question in just a second, but a little bit of a follow-up, Meredith, and I will put you on the spot a little bit. Sure, do you I have, have any, lots to say. Do you have any sense of where virtual and massive online might converge? Yep. Presumably there are technology and bandwidth considerations, but uh, if anybody who's played around in that space has experienced the engagement of virtual. Mm -hmm. Is that one of the answers? So yeah, the, th the two things that I immediately think of, and um, I know some, I, I'm not, I wonder about how you get people to work together in these types of courses. Like, so this, there's one thing for skin in the game if you have just you, but if you have to like a problem that you have to, you have to bring other people together and you really have to make that communication, not just, hey, how's your experience with the course, but hey, you know, we need to figure this out and have it be real world problems. Now, granted, looking through a cell is not a real world problem, but figuring out what's wrong with a cell is one step towards that. Um, what you're asking about, Jeff, is actually the technology and the tech, te te the technology comes a lot way, in a long way, even in short periods of time. So it's getting there. One of the things that we've been doing is thinking about how to use VR in low resource environments, right? How do you get VR out to a, a wider range of people? And some people say that there's an equity issue involved and we shouldn't use VR because not everybody can use it. Well, in fact, what we want to think about is how do we accelerate the process for ha having this very impactful way of learning and how do we develop good content and good experiences that really motivate learners? So I would say, yes, there's an opportunity for that. I think it would be really cool. I think it's coming. We need your help to think about how do we activate learners in these environments in ways that are meaningful and really engaging. If I could add one more thing to that about doing real work in virtual world, uh, several of the large construction firms, and I know CDM Smith is doing this, uh, they already found out that it was just easier to work in the virtual world. So at CDM Smith, for example, they have the virtual to look at the water plant they're building or the dam they're planning, they're building. Uh, but then one of the engineers from San Francisco actually said, why would I get on a plane and fly to Boston for an hour long meeting and lose three days in the process? Let's just both put on the goggles and meet inside that dam that we haven't built yet. And so they really are collaborating. And so one of the things we might be able to do is learn from how people are really collaborating to figure out how to do it in the courses too. Hi there, I'm Kristen Merner, and I'm uh, fortunate to work in actually a learning science department, <laughs> and uh, which is great. Um, but we're still suffering just a little bit from your trainer to CLO model. And I was curious what best practices you may have for me <laughs> in trying to get more buy-in, even for my colleagues who understand the value of having the department, but like to view us as a consultant and go, hmm, that's very interesting, and then do whatever they want anyway. So I was curious. Uh, I, I'll <laughs> say the short thing, and we should talk longer. Um, if you're waiting for them to accept you as a partner, you will die. You will die before they accept you. And so there are behaviors to take on, to start really taking their perspective, to start figuring out how you can be more about value than cost, mm -hmm. uh, to start thinking about how you can build with them and not. And you start it, and eventually they accept you. But we can talk about this much more offline. Great. I was uh, in a conversation with a learning and development executive who was struggling with that transition as well. Um, she had a manager come to her and say, my engineers are pissing off the customers. Mm -hmm. And the problem was the engineers were talking to the customers the same way they talk to each other. That's a stupid idea. Um, and and <laughs> surprising, it wasn't going over well. Um, so the manager says, build me a course so that the engineers can learn some of these human interaction skills as opposed to whatever sort they've, they've uh, come to have. Um, but still, she was on demand, right? She was an order taker, to use George's term. She built a course that somebody wanted. Um, after the fact, she went back, which is a first proactive step to say, did it work? And he said, you know, I didn't really think about it. She said, well, what, what were you hoping would change? And she said, well, or the, the manager said, what I, hoping, what I was hoping would change is that customers would stop calling me being upset. And, and that in fact happened. So now when she goes into engagements with her internal clients about the learning that they want in more of a proactive way, she wants them to imagine how the outcomes will be different because she wants to be measured against that. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Prakash Telly and I am the CTO of a company called Mitchell Learning. And we specialize in a competency-based degree programs for non-traditional learners. And my interest is in this competency and a career maps. Currently, we are working on a productization of that particular aspect. 
but I want to know if you have any insight, any research that you have done or any guidance on exactly. So we are working with employers and actually trying to come out with a model of how we can map competencies to skills gaps within uh, employer network. Uh, any insight you may have? So this is really fascinating. We tried to put together a competency taxonomy just for these 21st century social future ready skills for the workplace. And we found now over 40 different taxonomies. They overlap about 50%, 60% each. And so we're creating a new one and maybe that can be something we can build upon. Uh, that's one of the problems is there's so many of them out there that we don't have standards. And in other places, they, there just aren't any at all. Uh, so one of the things we're starting with the United Nations actually is, is a working group to start thinking through what are some of these skills we'd want to think about? Can we build up some, um, some competency maps there? Also working with some of the other major players in this field, many of whom are here, uh, to start thinking how we get at that. So what we should do is have you join that conversation and figure out where we're going. Yeah. Got another five or so minutes if anybody's got converse or questions about any of this work or more generally uh, research being done in the area of learning. Yes. Thanks for your time today. Uh, Michael Cosella, I'm working on, you know, the ed tech solutions, but more from the K through 12, right? And so a lot of this seems to be focused on adult learning. Have you done uh, sufficient research around that K through 12 environment? Because the, the hypothesis that I'm trying to work on is I love VR, but it's not really affordable at the school level and who's going to pay mm -hmm. for it. But if we can teach the kids to learn through the video game mode, which mm -hmm. they all millennial style, social media, all that stuff, then that transition carries into going to MIT and learning, et cetera, et cetera. So I just didn't, you know, the earlier you start teaching, right, mm -hmm. the better it sticks and becomes kind of a lifelong process. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just wondering, have you gone back in time to that K through 12, or have you been solely focused on the adult learning? And then two comments was, there's a platform called Zoom for virtual learning. Mm -hmm. uh, we use it for high performance coaching. Right. It's really easy. Um, and I, I'm ex supply chain uh, uh, operations. And what I found was we, we did ongoing education, right? <clears throat> we had to tweak the content, even though it's complicated, to make it more simple. So I think your, your hypothesis is very technical. Mm -hmm. And so we had to break that down to make it less technical. And I think the last piece was in the executive world and in the school world, the resource that they're missing is time. And they don't have time to take on additional content because they've got to meet the standards at Common Core in California and different standards across the nation. Um, so how do you, have you done that research and how do you start early, right? Um, to create that pattern of social learning, you know? So I'll just say quickly, my job is to do everything that's not pre-K to 12 in higher ed because we have a lot of people doing that. So mm -hmm. I have not done that research, but I believe some of you have, right? Yeah, and, and, and I can speak a lot to that. Um, one of the things that uh, you'll notice in the um, game about virtual reality is that we don't think virtual reality is the key. What changes education are educators. It's not technology, and it's never been technology. So the question really is, how do we develop good, both conceptual and also skill-based experiences? Content is going to be really, really important, and also meaningful applications of those content. A lot of people say 21st century skills are really important. Absolutely. We can't teach those skills without context. You've all been in that training when it's like, everybody work together. When you finally actually learn and use and develop these skills is when you have a reason to. So how do we develop those reasons? How do we take what we need to learn, those standards, and take what employers need us to have and bring them together in meaningful, it can be game-based, doesn't need to be VR, doesn't even need to involve modern technology either. What we need to do though is we need to have those meaningful experiences and we need to empower educators to have the resources and the ability to do that. One resource, we always say classrooms are resource poor. Absolutely, time, resources, but we don't use the resource we have the most of in the classes, which are the other students. How do you engage that? How do you build problem and project-based learning? How do you create these game-based scenarios so we can work together? We actually have a ton of resources, and it's human resources right in our classrooms. Right, and so 
it, it's interesting because it's this development of the social interaction and self-advocacy mm -hmm. and group learning and because what I'm focused on is introducing financial literacy in K through 12. Financial literacy? Yeah. Okay. So great. what mistakes should you not make, right? Mm -hmm. To get to a point so you know how to manage your money, you know what budgets are, you know how you're going to pay for college, mm -hmm. you know how to find a good rate, you know how banks are going to mail your credit card and you shouldn't use it. You know, that that is stuff. a great, those are amazingly important and meaningful applications, especially when you're looking back as an adult. How do we make those meaningful to kids? How do you bring kids in? Right. I bet you're thinking about that already. What sorts of things have you found? So, but I, I don't want to go too long on this in the public okay. forum I'll because, because I've got one more question and I'd like to so, hear that question. That's fine. Um, and then we've got the afternoon for do it. Do you want me to uh, give you I'm happy to talk to you after, after, okay? Okay, yeah. thanks. Yes, please. Hi. Uh, I, I happen to be a MIT alum from Center for Transportation and Logistics, year of 2000. Uh, and I have two kids, 11 and 7 year old. Question is, um, you know, have, is there any research that you're doing where learners can actually decide what they want to learn, who they want to learn with, who they want to learn from, and also for the educators or the coaches to learn from the learners? That's really interesting. So you are like allowing learners to build their own path uh, through That's the right. contents that we have. That's right. It could be curricular like math, STEM, or it could be astronomy, pottery, stuff that they otherwise don't pursue but want to pursue. That's so in, in the case of our micromasters, and I guess like this is a more open question and you can also contribute. Um, we are kind of stuck uh, with, the, with the contents because we are providing a credential that is actually valued as half a master's degree at MIT. So that's, that's what it is. If, uh, we, we can tweak things, but we have to cover the topics that are, like, agree, we agreed we're going to cover. But I, th I think that's a super interesting idea to allow people to build their own um, learning experience right. in, in, a, in, a, in an online platform. So, uh, yeah, I think that that's a, an idea worth exploring. Sounds like there's a task for the entrepreneurs out there then to build that. Yep. Um, we're well, at I'll, time. I'd like to say oh. one more thing on that. In the workforce, it's actually a really interesting area. There's so many different kinds of things that are out there. Uh, the, the best chief learning officers we're seeing are starting to say which courses when we take them, does it actually bump somebody's performance or not? And do we drop those, right? The other things they're doing are they're looking for keyword searches. And they're saying, well, if those keyword searches are missing, we're going there. My favorite was one company where the, uh, the most popular search term in their thing was not how to be a better engineer, not how to learn how to speak Spanish. It was how to make small talk. <laughs> and so they had to develop a course on that. Thank Obviously a tech company. <laughs> Great. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Uh, thank our panel for, for taking some time out of their day. And uh, have a great rest of your Learn Launch. <laughs>